The Lord's here and he's able to meet any need that you have, any burden you've been carrying. doesn't matter how depressed or oppressed you are. There's a God who can see you through. That's why we're here, because we believe in this Lord and we know that he's able. Amen? God is good. Let's give him praise one more time. Let's give him praise. He is so good. He is so good. Amen. Would you take your Bibles and open it to Malachi chapter 3? And while you're doing that, we, uh, we've been experiencing some unseen reality. I, I, I don't know where Ed Scoggins is sitting. I know he was close behind me because I could hear him saying, praise the Lord and amen. Ed, there you are. Ed survived what could have and perhaps should have been uh, an absolute tragedy. Uh, but God spared Ed's life. He had quite a very serious heart attack. And the Lord, uh, the Lord has brought him through. Can we give the Lord praise for this unseen reality and what God has done? And, and, and you, you might, I don't have time to flesh out the details. You might say, well, it's common to survive heart attacks today. Well, let me tell you, the kind he had and with what happened to him and where he was and how he was hard-headed and kept, kept quit ignoring his body. Uh, that's not humor, Ed. I'm being serious with you. But anyway, the Lord is good. And we celebrate our brother standing here today because God is good. Dolores, I don't know where you are. Dolores, Doy and Dolores are somewhere in this room. Owens, we got to note, Doy and I are so thankful that extensive testing this week gave positive results in regards to my breast cancer diagnosis. I am absolutely thrilled. Your prayers have been felt. Please continue as I take, continue to take precautionary treatments, but God is good and has answered my prayers. Can we give the Lord praise for that? Uh, yes. He's at work. He's at work. Can we give the Lord praise for that? Malachi 3, beginning with verse 1. Behold, I send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight behold he is coming says the Lord of hosts but who can endure the day of his coming and who can stand when he appears for he is like a refiner's fire and like launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. When the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasant to the Lord, as in the days of old, as in former years. I want to drop down to verse 10. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. How many want food in the house of God? That there may be food in my house. And try me now in this. Try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour you out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Some of you think you know where I'm going, but you don't. Father, make it easy to preach. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. The book of Malachi presents a language like a struggling man who has lost his lover. God's relationship is strained with his people, so God decides... He's going to make the first move with the hopes of reconciling with his lover. So he tells his people through the prophet Malachi, I'm going to send you an offering. I'm going to send you a, a gift that will absolutely be the best thing that's ever happened to you. In fact, this gift that I'm going to give you is beyond your ability to imagine what I'm going to do through it. It will change your world. It will change the view that you have of your world. This gift I will send will guarantee that you have a future with me. It will make you eternally wealthy. This gift will 
be your salvation when you need to cash it in. It will be your provider when you need provision. It will be your protector when you need protection. It will be your healing when you need a healer. It will be your deliverer when you need deliverance. It will be your comfort when you need comforting. It will be so amazing that my hopes are that you will love it so much that you will want to run and return to me because you will discover how much I love you through this gift that I'm going to give you. So here it is. And here's how I will do it. I will send you that which will be an unseen reality. In the Old Testament, that unseen reality will be just a promise. A promise that really can only be heard, but the reality of it will be unseen. In the Old Testament, it will be a, a promise. In the beginning of the New Testament, that unseen reality will come in the form of a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. And later, that unseen reality will become a man, then a resurrected Savior. And today, that unseen reality sits at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for you and I. He's there. Do you believe it? He is there. He has not divested himself from his throne. He is still there, high and lifted up. Could you give him praise because he's there? Let's do that right now. He's there. So the gift is coming. That's what God is speaking through Malachi 3. It's what Malachi 3 is all about. Just know that this amazing offering, this gift is coming. I'm going to make the first move. I want you back. I didn't do any wrong. You may have done all the wrong, but it doesn't matter. I love you so much, I'm going to give you a gift. Here's the question. Have you ever had a gift given, a gift hoping to, a gift that you gave hoping for something in return? Have you ever given a gift hoping for something in return? Well, when you gave the gift, that which you wanted was an unseen reality, but it was given with the hope that the unseen reality would soon become a reality. Don't look at me like that. There's a phrase that I want you to keep in mind as we weave through this passage of Scripture. We really do give to get. We really do give to get. And that's exactly what God did. You might say that he gave to get. We, we, we like that phrase, you don't ever give to get. Well, you're lying because you do give to get. You wouldn't be married if you didn't give to get. Some of you are with me. Some of you brought gifts. You learned how to, there's all kinds of language for this. You learned how to date. You learned how to uh, court. You learned how to, um, I don't even remember what the modern term is, but there's another term for it. You, you've learned how to do it. You've learned how to hunt. You've learned how to give gifts hoping that there would be something in return. It was an unseen reality. All you had was hidden hope in your heart. That's all you had. Hidden hope. You lived with that hope. And then you gave, hoping that more would come out of that because you had a desire to be, to be married. Now, some of you are sitting there looking at me like I'm nuts. You are lying. I am not. <laughs> you gave to get. That's what God did in this passage. That's what God did in the scripture. He gave his son to demonstrate his love that he might get you. Are you happy for that? <laughs> Some of you aren't sure. He gave to get. You, you give to get. The hope was that your giving, the gift of expressions of love, would make that unseen reality a reality. And that's what God does in relationships. So what can we learn from Malachi 3? First, we learn that God gave to us. And I'm only going to get to that first point today. We'll continue next week with a couple other points. But God gave to us. In verses 1 through 5, it's very clear. God gave to us. Would you say that with me? God gave to us. 
In fact, let me just say this, and I may say it again. Malachi 3, you make a big mistake if all you see is the need that you have to be obedient and give to God your tithes and offerings. If that's all you see, you're missing a lot in this. You see, Malachi 3 is about relationship. It's about a loving God that has given to you, and man, has he given. He's given big. I mean, he's really given big. And he's given to you, and he asks you to give back. But it comes out of a loving relationship. God loves you. That's what the choir just sang to us. God loves you. And, and there's, another, there's another way of saying it. Oh, how he loves you and me. God loves us. So God gave to us. God gave to us, the first thing that we see here, a prepared gift. Look at verse 1. This is a prepared gift. And this gift is so prepared that God decides to be strategic about it. He sends a messenger. God plans on giving an offering or a gift to his people who are the object of his love. But before he gives his gift, he's going to send a message, messenger to prepare for the gift's arrival. You might say that even God prepared before he gave his offering. The unspoken principle here is that offerings to your lover shouldn't be flippant or casual. They should be thought out. Offerings should be strategic. Gifts should be strategic with your lover. You don't just flippantly pull something out and say, oh, yeah, by the way, I'll tell him myself, I did that one time and I'll never do it again. I'll tell you that. I forgot Mother's Day one time. It was awful. Wasn't Debbie awful? I was in my 20s and I was youth pastoring down at Woodmore and we got in the car and I'd been asking Debbie all week, have you got my mother a card? I haven't had a chance to get by the, by the, by the, by the store to get a card. And, 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 and I'd been asking her all week, and, and I was just, just knew she was going to forget. And, and, of course, I had her mother mine too. And did, did, you, did you get the mother's a card? And, and I got in the car, and we were on our way, headed, getting ready to back out of the parking lot to head to church. And I said, oh, did you get that card? It's Mother's Day today. And she looked at me, and she goes, a horrible feeling came over me. <laughs> and I said, oh, I'll take you to dinner today. She said, you take me to dinner every Sunday. <laughs> that was awful. I don't even remember what I did for the rest of the day. It was awful. But I've never done that again. I don't think. I've never done that again. You see, sometimes we can get rather flippant and casual in our love relationships. And God is saying, I want you to be intentional. I want you to be intentional with me just as I have been intentional with you. I prepared the way. I sent a messenger. I sent a man ahead of time to kind of get it out there and announce that it's coming so you could kind of be prepared. You could be prepared when I made the announcement. You could be prepared in your heart for worship. And you could be prepared and know what to do when I show up with my gift. And so I'm going, to send a, I'm going to send a messenger so it's not a surprise to you or it's not a secret to you. I want you to know that the day is coming. The day is coming, so get ready. Get, get ready so if you really want to, you can give back to me, but I'm going to give to you anyway. I'm going to give to, give to you whether you give back to me or not because I love you so much, but, but it would be wonderful if you knew I was coming. It would be wonderful if we could just kind of prepare for this whole thing. That's what God has in mind. Do you, do you get that? A messenger. I'm going to send you... A, a messenger in his preparation he said that he would send a messenger whose role it would be to announce the coming of an offering or a gift to mankind an unimaginable gift was on the way R read Mark and Luke and, and see how God strategically set up this gift with preparation the message was very simple later in the New Testament we see the fulfillment of the pro pro prophecy in the life and the ministry of John the Baptist that's the messenger this is a prophecy that John the Baptist is going to come. So when you start hearing this announcement, get ready. Armed with a simple message of repent for the kingdom of God is at hand, he began to say, there's one coming after me who's, who's much greater than I. You, you think my message is something and you think you're finding amazing things in God through my message, but there's one coming who's, who's, who's I'm not even worthy to bend over and, and tie up a Velcro on his sandals. He's amazing. I, I don't know what to tell you except he's so much bigger than me. And he began to proclaim this message. God didn't just casually drop his offering into the world basket as it turned and floated by. 
He gave with strategic intentionality. And this is clear that after the offering was given, John declared in John 3, 16, oh, you've all heard it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What a gift. Could we give him praise for that gift, that amazing gift that he has given us? It's amazing. God was prepared with his offering. And so should you and I be prepared with our gifts that we bring to him. Pastor Jason has encouraged you to stop and think before you let the offering pouch pass by. Questions should be asked, why am I giving? What is God saying to me about am I giving? What should I be giving? You and I cannot answer those questions in a fleeting moment when all of a sudden offering sneaks up on us. It's just what we do. I've been raised in church. So it's just what we do. And if we're not careful, we'll get flippant and casual about the very thing that God wants from you. Your money is just a symbol and a sign of where your heart is. Some of you are aggravated because I've even brought money up in the subject today. I've had people, when you just touch the topic, who won't come back next Sunday or they'll walk out and leave. I've had that happen. Just because you touch the subject. You see... When that's there, there's a bigger problem than your money. There's a heart issue. And if you take that position, I'm going to tell you unequivocally and very boldly out of love, you have a heart issue. And God wants to work on your heart just as he wants to work on my heart and your heart. This is not about money. This is about a right heart. And when the right heart is there, I'm telling you when the right heart is there, and you have a loving relationship with him just like you might have with another human being, you can't help but want to give. You want to give. You want things to be good. You want, to, you want things to be, you want favor, to share favor back and forth. I'm telling you, it's a heart issue. And if there's anything that you see in Malachi 3, that's exactly what you see. You find later God crying out, return to me. Come to me. Come to me. The, the tithes and offerings are a byproduct of that. And, and, and you just come to me. I've given you a gift, so would you give back to me? It's a heart issue. Could somebody say amen? Listen to the Apostle Paul's instructions in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 5 through 8. Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time. Wait, did you catch that? Ahead of time and prepare your generous gift beforehand. How many of you would have liked that? For some guy to show up and prepare the way for the offering and to say, uh, get ready. We're going to be taking offering on such and such a date. Could you get your plans and get ready because you're, you're going to need to give. Some of us would get real uncomfortable with that. But the Apostle Paul actually said, that's what I want you to do. I want you to think about what you're doing. You know, we sing. And, 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 and we can, I'm just going to back up. We can get real flippant about worship. We can get real casual about, well, I'm not talking about your emotional response. I'm not talking about that at all. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not pushing for any kind of emotional response. I'm talking about the heart. We can get so used to the stuff that goes on in our worship experiences, and we can get flippant and casual. But I'm telling you, our Lord wants your heart. He wants your heart. Bring your heart to the table when you, when you take communion. Bring your heart to the family room when you sing. Bring your heart. Bring your heart when you open up your wallet or you type in a text number or you give online. Bring your heart to the experience and say, oh, God, I thank you for the way you've blessed me. I thank you for your blessings to me day by day. I thank you that I have provision. I thank you that I have a job. Thank you for your many blessings that you've given my life. Thank you, thank you, thank you for what you do for me. That's the way we should approach worship. Now, could we give him praise from our hearts today? From our hearts. That's what God wants is our hearts. You see, when a gift has been thoughtfully prepared, when a gift has been considered and its presentation has been thought through, then the receiver is blessed. Let me say that another way. When a gift has been thoughtfully prepared and when a gift has been considered and its presentation has been thought through, then the gift has more meaning to the receiver. 
I've watched some of you do amazing, thoughtful, creative things when you're just getting ready to ask your spouse to marry you. I should say you men when you ask your women to marry you. Creativity. Thought through. You can offer a valuable gift, a ring. And you wait for the answer. Most of you know what the answer is going to be before you do it or you'd never do it. Am I right? You've already sent messengers out. And you've tested the waters. Because woe unto us if we're ever rejected, Greg. It's not pretty. Do you get what I'm saying? And when that gift is thought through, and the presentation is thought through, it's so much more meaningful to the receiver. Do you understand what pastor's driving at today? When you think and pray about your giving, when you pray about what you're doing unto the Lord, when you pray, God, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to do it? How do you want me to present this to you? Am I making any sense? When a gift has been thoughtfully prepared, it's more meaningful. What, what is God saying? He's saying that he took the time to prepare the, so he would have an off, so he would offer a present, presentable gift to you and I. God took the time to prepare. The question is, why are we so casual with him when he hasn't been casual with us? Why are we so flippant with him when he has not been flippant with us? God gave a gift that was thought through. It had tremendous value, a gift that would come wrapped in swaddling clothes, a gift that would cost heaven greatly. It was valuable. This gift was presented to mankind with strategic planning, insight, and preparation. And those are the exact qualities he wants us to possess when we give to him. That's good stuff, Pastor Craig. He loves us so much, he takes the time. So much he loves you and I. Not only did God give us a prepared gift, but God gave us a pure gift. Look at verses 2 through 5. You will find some unique words there like refine and laundress, soap and all kinds of stuff like that. I mean, this was an amazing gift. And for you to be a gift that's presented back to God, you need it cleaned up. <laughs> you need it cleaned up. You couldn't just walk into his presence. You need it cleaned up. And the gift that he sends, sends is so amazing. Not only is it valuable, not only does it give you eternal life, not only does it, do, I mean, I've already mentioned amazing things that this gift does for you day by day that comes out of the relationship we have with him, but he also cleans you up. We see this, how he refines. Look at verses 2 and 3. And who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and laundry soap. And he will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer to the Lord. When you bring your offering to the Lord, it is worthless unless you've been cleaned up by him. Because when you drop your offering into the offering pouch or any gift that you give, you need to understand you're giving to him. And to come to him, you have to have, you have, to have a Jesus that's covering you. You have to have a Jesus. And it's not about you just giving your tithe and offering. It's all his anyway. In fact, he really doesn't need it to survive. He asks you for it because he wants you to prove your love back to him. Boy, this is good, Pastor Kelvin. This is good. It, it really is. And you have to be ready to give. Over and over we're told that your sacrifices are worthless if your heart's not right. What are you saying, Pastor Kelvin? I'm telling you that there is a blood screen that, stand, that exists between you and your heavenly father. And that's that refiner's soap. That's that laundry soap. That's that purification. And when God the father looks at you, looks at you, Dennis, looks at you, Greg, looks at you, Bill, looks, looks at David, doesn't looks at any one of us. When God looks at us, he looks at us through that blood screen. I've told you this before. And what does he see? He, see, he does not see your unrighteousness. He does not see your miserable failures this week. He does not see your dirty mouth this week. He does not see that you have in your heart something against somebody. He doesn't see any of that. What does he see? He sees purity and holiness. He sees oh, righteousness. He sees good things. Why? Because there is a blood screen that has you and I covered. It is a refiner's soap and a laundry soap that washes us clean. Could you give him praise for that? 
Yes. Oh, oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many proudly would say, I've been washed by the blood of the Lamb, and I thank God for it? Yeah. You say, Pastor, you're rather excited about that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm really excited about that because I know what a mess I've been. And I know what a mess I'm capable of being in the present. And it's only because of God's grace. His grace. We find it has results. A pure gift has results. God's gift we find so that we ourselves will be presentable before him. Not only did God give you and I a gift that is pure, but a gift that pursues. Look at verses 6 and 7. He says, he remains the same in his pursuit. For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed. Aren't you glad he loves us? Well, you ought to. Some of us got all excited at football games yesterday. I didn't go. Glad I didn't after I heard the score. But I'm just as capable of getting as excited at a football game as you are. You just ask my family. My wife would go in the other room sometimes. We get excited. But when you start talking about this idea that you are not consumed because I love you, You have breath in your body because I love you. I could melt your stuff down right now. I could say drop dead and you drop dead. But I don't because I love you. I love you. I don't know that we grasp the love of God. We sing about it. We'll talk about it now and then. But I don't know that we grasp it. He says, do you understand? You might even deserve to be consumed because I'm holy. You deserve to be consumed, but I don't because I love you. You see, that love is unchanging. It remains the same. He keeps giving. He keeps pursuing. That's what he's telling us. He keeps pursuing. His intent remains the same, and that is to have your affection, to have your affection back. He wants relationship with you, and because of this, he represses judgment. Thou art not consumed. He loves you so much that he represses the level of judgment we deserve. That doesn't mean that he never judges. That doesn't mean that he never disciplines. But he represses the level of that judgment. Aren't you glad he has repressed the level of that judgment? Malachi 3 brings this frustrating relationship God has with his people to a head. And he lays it on the line. Basically, God is saying, I will not lose you. I will not lose you. I will repress my anger and not consume you. Instead, I will give you a gift, an offering that you will not be able to refuse. Malachi 3 is not about money. This is a major misunderstanding of money. Money was simply a symptom, symptom of their lack of love for God. The mismanaging of money was a heart problem. A key word, which would be a symptom of the relationship problem God has with his people, is withholding. You'll find that in verse 8. You're withholding. You're withholding your heart. You withhold your money, yes. But the reason you're withholding your money is because you're withholding your heart. Another key word that would sum up verses 13 through 18, which has to do with complaining. You complain what I don't do for you. You withhold on me and withhold on me and withhold on me, and then you complain about me. You complain what I allow. You complain what I let go on. You complain all the time about me, but you're withholding yourself from me. This is lover language, friend. Lover language. I find it interesting that after God makes this promise, there's 400 years of silence. No, no, I'm not going to ask you to look at your spouse or your Boyfriend or girlfriend or anything else, but how many of you have used the silent treatment? Ooh. Then the question is, who's going to break the ice? 
In every relationship, there's one that tends to be quicker to break the ice. Now, don't go home and talk about this, please, without a counselor present. <laughs> but somebody usually tends to break the ice. I'm not going to be real vulnerable right now. I'm moving on. But the point I'm making, somebody usually says, I'm sorry first. Because one of us is generally too stubborn or mad or proud. Ooh, is it cool? A cold chill just went through here. And we have a disagreement. And it escalates until we get mad and then there's silent treatment. And, and it usually looks like this. One gets on one side of the bed and turns their back to them, and the other one gets on the other side of the bed and turns their back to them, and they go, I know, I mean, I've, uh, it's happened. <laughs> now it's getting warm. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! I feel this heat coming on my back. But anyway, let me move over here. It's silent treatment, and it happens. It happens in relationship. So God is saying in Malachi, I've got an offering. I've got a gift. I'm going to give you a gift. I mean, it's an amazing gift. I am going to pour this gift out on you. It is so amazing. You're not going to believe it. And then he gets silent for how many years? 400 years. God doesn't speak. And suddenly, on the backside of a desert, a group of shepherds are sitting there. Tending their sheep. And all of a sudden, an angelic host shows up. The gift is here. Unto you a child is born. That unseen reality of that promise is now a reality. He's in the form of a little bitty babe who looks so weak lying in a manger. Wow. I don't know. I can't help it. I want to give him praise. I'm so glad he has given this gift to us, to mankind. Where would we be without him? Could we do that right now? Lift it up. Lift it up. Come on. Give it to him. Thank you, Lord. Give it to him. Thank you, Lord. This whole giving business requires a return, and I'm going to close with it. God gives to get through giving. God pursues you and I, and get this, through your giving to God, you pursue him. I experienced this this weekend. I felt so bad yesterday, and I talked to Kyle in April just, just a little bit about it. Jacob is eight. Isaac is three. And these guys spend the night many times when a weekend hits. If Papa and Mimi are in town or our schedules aren't killing us, we'll try to get them over on a Friday night. And Isaac's three years old. He's getting strong. I'm not, not, not just strong physically, but strong-headed. And he interrupts Jacob's world. There's a little conflict thing starting. I've watched it kind of develop. And yesterday morning... And I, and, I, and I find myself giving to them. I love, I just, I can't explain to you. I love to give to them. I have a feeling that's the way our Heavenly Father is with us. I can't, I can't give everything because they're not capable of managing it, but I love to give to them. I love to give to my grandchildren. Is mean, anybody else like that? You love to give. And I just love to give to them. And, 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 and I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, I give to get. I give to just, <laughs> I bend down little Isaac, bend his neck up, and he wants to kiss. He's got this thing going, I can't, he just can't kiss me on one side, he's got to kiss me on both sides. No, 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 you that don't understand that, and you think I'm all, you think what you want to. You just wait till you get there. And I'll give to get there. Yesterday, I guess it's the second time he's been with us, and I had to just pop him. I kept telling him, don't do that. 
and Jacob, he's making Jacob mad, and Jacob wasn't helping matters either. But he brings in his suitcase, and he decides he's going to roll it across our bedroom. So he's rolling, that's okay, that, that's tolerable, but he rams it into Jacob. And so it happened three, four times, I kept telling him, don't do that, take the suitcase back, don't bring it back in here. A few minutes go by, <laughs> here he comes. So I really got on him. I said, you take that suitcase back out here now. Your papa's not going to tell you one more time. Now get it out. Oh, you'd have thought I killed him. <laughs> I saw the, there's a little rebellion. I'll do it. I'll do it because you're bigger than me. But that's the only reason I'm doing it. So he goes out and throws himself on the couch. Well, I felt the Holy Ghost come on me. <laughs> so I went out on that couch, and I said, what are you doing? Yeah. He took his hand. You can go turn me in if you want to. That's all I did. You'd have thought I killed him. I said, you don't ever act that way around your papa. When he tells you to do something, I expect it to be done. Well, I'm feeling bad. I mean, I'm feeling bad. I didn't want to talk to Debbie about it. We get him all the Cracker Barrel. I have to pay the ticket. That's okay. Well, then I heard him say on the way in, he wanted one of those M&M things, a fan filled up with M&Ms. And I thought, what I, about what I was preaching today. I thought, I'm going to give this to get something back. So we went through breakfast, and he's walking out, and I said, hey, want one of those? His eyes got that big. I didn't even ask his mom and dad. I didn't give a rip what they thought. <laughs> I got him a tube of those M&Ms, and they had a fan. Well, then I had to get Jacob one. Man, I mean, the whole world opened up. Hugs, kisses, greatest papa in the world. Whew. Man, it didn't make my day go better. Do you understand what I'm saying? You have a heavenly father. Us so much. He cares. And he's given and given and giving and giving. He's given the greatest gift he could ever come up with. A gift that's made provision for you for all of eternity. And all he wants is a little bit back of what he's given to you. It's a father's heart. It's a father's heart. He loves you. He loves you. You're going to walk out of here today and some of you are going to go sit down to a meal. You know why you have it? Because he's given. You're going to go home and you're going to sit under a roof There's a chair and there's a bed. You know why you have it? Because he's given. He loves you so much. You know, that's the message today. This is the motivation for all giving. Because he has given to me. So, Malachi 3 is not just about giving. In fact, if that's all you're hung up on is verse 8, 9, and following, you're missing what Malachi 3 is all about. It's about a loving God who gives big gifts and who has done big things. 
And you know what he wants to do? He wants you to know this. This is for some of you who feel so unloved. If you can't get a hold of this, of what he's already done for you, can you understand that he continues to give to you and give to you? You might not get everything you want because if I gave Jacob and Isaac everything they wanted, it could cost them their lives. It could destroy them because they can't manage it. We may not get everything we want, but God keeps giving and he knows what you need and he loves you.